Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the City and County of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the December 4th, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30. This is an in-person live stream meeting format. Members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you have typed your name and it reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an item. If you have any technical questions, please direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use your raise hand feature to answer any questions or comment on an item. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button at the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light is on and their microphone is on when you are prepared to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. A reminder during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates may speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comment. Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet. Please sign in. And at this time, TAC members and alternates in person here will introduce themselves. For the roll call, uh, we'll start with Mr. Kretzinger. David Kretzinger, uh, City of Denver Transit. Jessica Michelbust, CDOT, Region 1. Brent Sutherland, Arapahoe County and City of Littleton. Simmons, a little help, senior special interest. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Carson Priest, TDM special interest seat. Mike Whitaker, Lakewood. Kevin Nash, Weld County, Frederick. Mark Siderite, Boulder County. Jeff Dankenburn, Arapahoe County, representing. Wally Wirt, special interest, Freight. Phil Greenwald, City of Longmont, Boulder County. Kent Mormon, Adams County, City of Thornton. Matt Callison, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora. Good afternoon, uh, Sean Poe, Adams County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest Seat. Frank Bruno, via Mobility Services. Sanson, City of Boulder. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cox Staff. Air Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cox Staff. John Papsdorf, Dr. Cox. Jim Houston, Region 4, CDOT. Kurt Griffith, Douglas County, Douglas County. Uh, Justin Schmidt, Douglas County, City of Lone Tree. Tom Rice, Douglas County, City of Castle Rock. Ryan Weimer, Rappo County. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Chris Quinn with RTD. Lauren Curgis, Dr. Cog Staff. Jennifer Bartlett, City and County of Denver. Jordi Ayers, Special Interest for Aviation. Always the caboose, Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Special Interest. Hello, everybody. And at this time, um, I'll turn it over to Jacob. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple announcements at the beginning of the meeting. First, I just wanted to take note of our agenda packet. You will notice it looks very different um, than it has in the past. Um, as we continue along with CDOT, RTD, and local governments towards compliance with House Bill 1110 uh, related to accessibility of our materials, we have and will continue to make changes to the products and materials um, that we produce at Dr. Cog. So um, this is a work in progress, but um, you can see many differences to our agenda packet this month, particularly the memos associated with the agenda item, um, just in terms of formatting, color, those sorts of things um, on our journey to help make them more accessible. So I wanted to point that out. Uh, we do not have any membership changes this month that I am aware of. However, we are in open solicitation for two of our special interest seats. We are filling the non-motorized active transportation special interest seat and the transportation equity special interest seat. So hopefully all of you should have received an e-blast from me within the last couple of weeks. Uh, we'll also be sharing on social media. But if you know folks um, that would be good candidates, 
please feel free to forward um, those announcements around. Pretty simple sort of four or five question application uh, for candidates to fill out. Those are due um, end of the day on December 15th. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rager, Dr. Cog and Dr. Cog's staff for making these agendas available to the public. Uh, now we will move on to public comment. Um, public comment is limited to three minutes. If you have joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak in which we'll ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. At this time, do we have a public comment here in person or online? Thank you, Madam Chair. I do not see any hands raised online or in person at this time. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, at this time, we will move on to the meeting summary uh, for the October 2023 Advisory Committee meeting summary. If there's any discussion or corrections, um, please let me know. Thank you for reviewing the meeting summary from the October 2023, uh, 23, 2023 meeting. Um, the minutes will stand approved um, and we will move on to the next item. We will move on to the business items. We have several action items for today. First item number four is the election of chair and vice chair. This is attachment B in your packet and I'll turn it over to Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So per our committee guidelines, we elect our TAC officers for two year terms and we do that in odd numbered years as we are here in 2023. Um, so the, the next term of our officers two year term will be 2024 and 2025. I want to first start by acknowledging and thanking our current chair, Sarah Grant, and our current vice chair, Phil Greenwald, for their service to TAC over the last two years. It's very much appreciated. At the October meeting, um, I solicited volunteers for a nominating panel, um, and I want to thank um, Bill Saroy, Brody Ayers, uh, David Krutzinger, and uh, Frank Bruno uh, for serving on that nominating panel. We did a solicitation after the October meeting uh, for candidates, and then the nominating panel worked together um, to recommend to you um, a slate of candidates for chair and vice chair, again, for 2024 and 2025. The recommended candidate for chair is Sarah Grant, and the recommended candidate for vice chair is um, Justin Schmitz from the city of Lone Tree. So um, the way I'd like to do this is we will open nominations for each position to see if there are any other nominations from the floor. If there are not, then I would like to do this as a voice vote by acclamation. If there are nominations and we do have a competitive election, we have actually printed super secret ballots um, that we will pass out to folks um, and we will do it by secret ballot. As a reminder for voting, those of you that are TAC members and those of you that are alternates here today in place of your member are eligible to vote. If you are an alternate here today but your member is also here, then your member would vote, um, but you as the alternate would not, um, would not be eligible to vote. So before I go farther, just want to see if there's any questions. Okay. Let's start with chair. Let me open it up. Are there any nominations for the floor um, for the position of chair? Going once. Okay. All right. In that case, um, then our, um, our candidate for chair is Sarah Grant. Um, again, I'd like to do this by affirmation. So as a voice vote, all those in favor of electing Sarah Grant as chair for 2024 and 2025, say yes. Yes. All right. In an acclamation vote, there is not a, a no option. So we have just elected you, Sarah, as chair for the next two-year term. So congratulations. Thank you. All right. Let's do this again for vice chair. Again, let me open it up for nominations from the floor for other vice chair candidates. And going once. Okay. All right, then again, our single candidate for vice chair is Justin Smith. 
Schmitz, sorry. <laughs> we just stumble over that for the next two years, probably. <laughs> sorry, sir. Um, so again, let's do this as a voice vote by acclamation. All those in favor of Justin Schmitz for vice chair for the next two years, say, I actually say aye. 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 All right, congratulations to our new officers. Madam Chair, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, really appreciate that. It's been an honor to serve as the Transportation Advisory Committee and continue for the next two years. Thank you to Mr. Greenwald for um, Vice Chair position and filling in for uh, the position this last year. And welcome, um, Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> Um, the item number five in your packet. This is the Transportation Improvement Program Amendments. This is attachment C. Turn it over to Josh Schwenk, Senior Transportation Planner for this agenda item. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I do have a pretty simple set of uh, amendment proposals for you here. Let me size a bit. All right, thanks for bearing with me. Um, so I do just have two proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program, and these are actually both related to the same action. Uh, so we would be taking uh, $12.8 million in state faster funding, transferring that from the Region 1 faster pool, and applying it towards the I-70 resurfacing project between Chief Hosa and West Colfax in Golden. Uh, that is the uh, entirety of the proposed um, amendments. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we do have a proposed recommendation in your packet. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Are there any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? Seeing none. Mr. Mr. Weimer, I didn't see your hand there. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Weimer. We have a motion. And that motion is to remove or to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project amendments uh, to the fiscal year 2024-2027 TIP. Thank you, Mr. Weimer. Do we have a second? Thank you, Mr. Reif. And do we have any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion uh, carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Thank you. Next agenda item is item number six in your packet. This is the, um, I'm sorry, yes, number six, fiscal year 2023 project delays. This is attachment D in your packet, and I'll turn it over. Brad Williams, planner. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brad Williams, planner with Dr. Cog. Today we'll be talking about fiscal year 23 first year TIP project delays. The current TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address delays if they happen. These delays, regardless of the reason, tie up the limited funding available for Dr. Cog to allocate. The end of federal fiscal year 23 in early October. Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD review the statuses that we have collected from sponsors over the year for projects with FY23 funding. After confirming these project statuses, Dr. Cog's staff contacted the sponsors with project phases that were not, not initiated and therefore delayed to find out the reason for their fiscal year 23 phase uh, delay, to discover the current status of the project, 
and to assist them to develop a plan to initiate the delayed project phase. The attached report summarizes the project phases that were delayed as of October 1st, 2023. Overall, 35 projects were first year delayed, of which one has already been initiated and is no longer delayed. Uh, the number of, project, of delayed projects is approximately uh, double what a normal year sees primarily due to a busier than normal call for project cycle. Uh, we normally have two in a year. We, uh, recently we had four. Uh, therefore, that caused a lot of slowdowns in the IGA process um, due to the increased number of projects over that time, uh, which consequently caused delays in the uh, IGA execution, amendments to the IGAs, and clearance approval. Um, about half of these were directly tied to IGA slowdowns, and many others, as I mentioned, um, dealt with cascading effects due to the IGA slowdown. Uh, to avoid a second year delay, all projects identified in this report must initiate their delayed phase by July 1st, 2024. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, I could take those. If not, we have a, a motion for you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you for that summary. Uh, Rick Pilgrim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, uh, is there a dollar total that is wrapped up in this? And then is, is there any funding that would be at risk uh, for a delay? Uh, first off, the funding risk is only if you guys decide to not approve an extension for these projects. Uh, back of the napkin math is about $60.8 million in Dr. Cog funds for federal fiscal year 2023. And is that similar for past years? That just seems like a, a high number of projects. The, the number of projects is higher than a traditional year in the past, um, but funding type or, or funding amount is about what you'd expect to see for this amount of projects. Pap Storch? Sorry, Brad, I should have asked this before. You, did you mention one project is current that's on this list is current is has been resolved and is no longer delayed? Could you tell us which project that yes. is? Yes. Um, Aurora Smith Road multimodal improvements. Um, on the screen, it has been um, initiated since the October 1st deadline. No questions or comments? And if there's nothing else, I would like to take uh, the time to give everyone here a big thank you. I know a lot of you guys have worked directly with us in this process, and this is the first year where we've had um, uh, a good sample size of our own internal uh, project delays process where I've reached out on a monthly basis to get these updates. This has helped us um, be better prepared for the project delayed process, hopefully in the next year or two when we don't have a very busy call for, cycle, call for project cycle, we will see a uh, reduction in the amount of projects. So we really appreciate everyone here. Any questions or com further questions or comments? If not, we do have a proposed motion. Uh, Mr. Weimer. I'll make the motion for you. Um, I move to recommend to the RTC the proposed actions that were presented to us today uh, regarding the Transportation Improvement Pro Program project delays for fiscal year 2023. Thank you, Mr. Weimer. Is there a second? Mr. Mormon. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. When opposed? Or abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Williams. 
move on to item number seven in your packet. This is the Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan, Attachment E. I'll hand it over to Kelly Fallon, Emerging Mobility and Transportation Demand Management Plan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaylee Fallon. I am the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, today, here with you to go over the final draft of the Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan. Um, so just as a, a quick reminder, um, the, the purpose of the regional TDM plan and why we're doing this now, um, essentially it is an overhaul to the last Dr. Cog um, short-range TDM plan, which was developed over a decade ago. And as we all know, um, the transportation landscape has drastically changed since then um, due to changes in travel behavior from COVID. Um, increases and changes in demographics, as well as new, tech, new and emerging um, technologies, including e-scooters, e-bikes, um, and automated vehicles. So um, really, we, um, are, we developed this plan in, in light of all these reasons. Um, and the mission of the TDM strategic plan is really to provide transportation partners in the Denver region with a framework to improve efficiency, mobility, and safety for travelers of all ages, incomes, and abilities by identifying actions that expand multimodal travel choices. So just really want to emphasize the travelers of all ages, incomes, and abilities here. Um, our project team, our stakeholder steering committee worked really hard to include equity considerations throughout the entire plan and toolkit. Um, um, so really emphasizing um, this mission statement that um, we're doing this for travelers regardless of age, race, um, income, and ability. Um, so this final plan is the accumulation of an 18-month planning process. Um, and so this plan was created um, through various different avenues, including the Stakeholder Steering Committee input, um, focus group feedback. So as a reminder, we did host seven focus groups. Um, those included focus groups on equity, focus groups with large employers, focus groups with rural communities and land use. Um, and then we also had a Dr. Cog internal staff workshop, as well as um, research and analysis done by our consultants. So Kind of all of these processes put together is what led to the um, formation of the recommendations within the plan. A couple of um, regional considerations or challenges that the um, plan identified, and these were identified through um, that stakeholder feedback as well as through that consultant research, um, include population growth, traffic congestion, safety and vision zero, transit access, the ongoing impacts of the pandemic, as well as in innovation and transportation technology. Um, these were all challenges that the um, plan identified as having, um, as, as challenges that TDM could play a, a key solution in addressing. Um, so just kind of setting the stage um, and really looking at the state of transportation in our region and what um, types of challenges can TDM really address. Um, so the the plan recommendations are really intended for Dr. Cog to lead and implement alongside regional partners. So really looking at what is Dr. Cog's role as the MPO in the region, what is our role in TDM work, how can we move the needle as the MPO? Um, and so there are a total of 10 recommendations. They fall into three different categories. Um, those categories are planning, policy, and services. Um, and those recommendations will describe how Dr. Cog, again, will expand and advance um, Dr. Cog's TDM work. Um, of course, this work will not be possible without um, partnerships and, and working alongside our regional transportation partners, but really want to emphasize that the recommendations in the plan are for Dr. Cog as an organization um, to, to implement and look at how can we um, further our own work here at Dr. Cog. 
Um, so these recommendations um, have not changed since they were last presented to the TAC in August, um, this past August. Um, we have added some minor clarifications and edits based on stakeholder steering committee feedback, based on public comment. Um, but as you see here, as these are worded, um, they remain unchanged. And um, I really just want to emphasize here that a lot of these recommendations are um, considerations for the next step forward. So for example, um, looking at this four, number four recommendation, consider integrating transportation demand management as a requirement for certain projects in the TIP. Um, that's not to say that we're going to require TDM um, right off the bat in TIP, in TIP um, projects, but really for Dr. Cog's staff to consider that, to explore that further, to look at what that might um, encompass, how we could possibly do that. So. Um, just want to make that that point of clarification that a lot of these recommendations um, have have words like consider or explore or prepare, um, so that, so they're more research based. And these are recommendations six through ten. So again, um, a lot of these are like number six, exploring the opportunity to reduce or remove the local match requirements. So if we were to do that, what might that look like? What might the challenges be? How could we um, how could we develop something like that that would work for all of our stakeholders? So again, no changes to these since um, I last presented to the TAC in August, um, but we did make some minor clarifications based on um, stakeholder feedback. So that is kind of an overview of the final plan. Um, and then in addition to the plan, there is the TDM toolkit. So this is a separate document, but it um, certainly supports the TDM plan, um, and this is intended to be a living resource for member governments, stakeholders, TDM practitioners um, to, to implement a variety of different TDM strategies. Um, and when we say living document, we are intending to update this toolkit. So this will evolve as um, strategies evolve, as, techno as new technology comes, um, comes online. So really we're, we're hoping that this will be a, um, a great foundational resource for our member governments looking to implement TDM um, in their jurisdictions and, and having it be um, and having it evolve with the landscape. So um, the TDM toolkit currently has um, about nine categories, including mobility services, mobility technology, transportation infrastructure, parking management, incentives for mode shift, roadway management public policies, employer programs, and education outreach and marketing. So really recognizing that successful TDM takes a suite of um, different strategies and putting those into the toolkit. So each toolkit strategy will include a description of what that strategy is, um, context, so how applicable it is to um, different land use types, different transit access types, different audiences, and different infrastructure quality. I um, really want to highlight here again the equity methodology. So um, our project team put a lot of thought and consideration into the equity um, methodology and considerations of each TDM strategy. Um, and then each strategy will also have um, case studies and resources for um, the user to reference. So here is an overview. I won't go through each strategy, but just so you get an idea, um, we have certainly quite a lot of different strategies um, over a variety of different categories to make sure that we are really um, hitting all points of successful TDM. And so um, we did wrap up a public comment period. So the public comment period um, started on October 2nd and ended on October 31st, so about a month-long public comment period. Um, the main platform that we used was a social pinpoint website, which you will see a screenshot to the left here, where members of the public were able to go on that website and answer these questions and um, also provide any general feedback that they had. Um, and so we had the um, draft plan, the draft toolkit, and an executive summary, as well as an executive summary in Spanish up on that social pinpoint site. So that really served as our virtual open house um, to collect those um, comments. We also received quite a few comments um, via email, and then the public had the option to write in to Dr. Cog for public comment, although we didn't get any, um, any mail or written comments that way. 
Um, and just want to point out that we did hold a stakeholder steering committee um, during this comment period to go over um, kind of the final draft of the, of the plan and toolkit um, and gathered feedback from our stakeholder steering committee that way as well. Just a couple of highlights um, from the public comments and what we heard the most of. Um, so we really heard a lot about intelligent transportation systems. Um, just for some context, this was originally in the toolkit as a strategy. Heard a lot of comments about how this is more of a TDM supportive strategy. So we did remove that from the toolkit. Um, as another example, we heard a lot about telework and remote work as well as flexible schedules and how that's a really important TDM strategy in our region um, and how we need to continue. Um, that behavior. So we did um, edit both the plan and the toolkit to put more emphasis on um, telework and remote work as a strategy and more resources for that. Um, and of course, probably to no one's surprise, we heard a lot about transit services, ridership and safety. Um, and so we, um, we did read through every, every public comment and um, answer every public comment. So that is in your packet. If you are curious, you can take a look and read through those. Um, and like I said, we did update both those documents based on this feedback that we received. So looking ahead and next steps for plan implementation, um, really want to highlight the cross-divisional work within Dr. Cog and going back to this idea that successful TDM really um, must encompass a suite of different strategies that fall under policy and infrastructure, land use and incentives, um, and recognizing that that work overlaps with the different divisions here at Dr. Cog. So not only will we be doing this work within Transportation Planning and Operations Division, um, but we'll also be working with our Communications and Marketing Division as well as our Regional Planning and Develop, um, Development Division to, to get those recommendations implemented. Um, and of course, we will be working closely with our state, regional, and local transportation partners. So with that, I have a um, proposed motion on the screen, but happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you, Ms. Fallon, for that overview. Are there any comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Mr. Pilgrim. Now? There we go. Um, and, and Ms. Fallon, um, I just want to compliment you because um, the, the evolution of TDM over the last 40 years uh, to, to arrive at a, a place like this is very impressive. And I think you, uh, you've really covered the waterfront on this. Um, I do have a, a question, though. And uh, if you could go back to slide nine, probably the easiest one to speak to. Uh, you know, this toolkit of a variety of things, uh, and, and I'm all for incentives for mode shift, especially as that affects uh, our environmental uh, considerations, air quality primarily. Um, but I, I will say, and this is just, Rick, you're getting a little old codgery, but um, when I drive around some of the changes that have been made to the road network uh, in favor of other modes, um, I wonder if we're not actually contributing to congestion at, at the uh, street level or the traffic signal level. And is there any, any way that we could be um, focused on, on the air quality results of taking away a lane or designating a different purpose for uh, the, the actual space that we have for these other kinds of modes. As I, uh, I, I've been surprised at the length of some of the backups and the queues that have resulted from some of the changes we've made. Yeah, so, so let me repeat the question just so I, I understand it. So your question is essentially, what are the air quality impacts if we repurpose a, um, a vehicle lane for like a bus lane only or a bike lane only, and then that causes maybe some backup congestion? Um, I would say that we did not look into that specific question. Um, I know Robert and his team are actually um, going to be talking about the congestion report later um, this afternoon. Um, but to answer your question, I, I don't know that we looked at that. And I see Ron has his hand raised, so I'd love to pass it to Ron. Mr. Papstorf? 
Sarah, Rick, thanks for the question. Look, it's a, it's a really important discussion point. I think it goes well beyond the TDMs, the regional TDMs. I think it's important for all of us to admit that these changes over time take time, that we don't expect immediate results, we don't expect people's behavior or the land use context, or the development pattern context around our transportation investments to change instantaneously. But if we don't make any change, I can guarantee you what we continue to get is the status quo. So if we're not satisfied with the status quo, if we're not satisfied with our air quality, if we're not satisfied with our greenhouse gas emissions, if we're not satisfied work with our current mode share across modes, we've got to make some changes. And part of those changes is how we design and construct our transportation improvements and our transportation infrastructure. And we've got to start, right? And so I think at some point we're trying to match the changes in development patterns, land uses that local governments are doing with the transportation and infrastructure investments. Messy, it's going to take some time. Well, and, and I totally agree with that, Ron. Um, the, the only um, stipulation I would make is that uh, we should encourage the, lo the local agency that, you know, in, in their enthusiasm for their project to, to make sure that, that as they uh, make those kinds of changes that they're ready for um, ways to make improvements, especially with air quality and the you know, idling of, of the traffic that's sitting there. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? Green. Mr. Greenwald. Ms. Fallon, I just wanted to thank you for adding, or and Dr. Cog, of course, for adding the telework piece of that. I think it's so important with the TDM strategies to include that, and I know our staff made a number of those comments. So thanks for including those. Appreciate it. Thank you. Callison. Thank you. Uh, good presentation. We appreciate it, Kayla. Uh, question on slide 13, all out on mobility hubs. Uh, does the report provide some insight in terms of how those are actually in partnership with local jurisdictions? Element community projects move major projects, master planning. Thank you. Yeah, so we did get quite a few comments just expressing interest in just what you asked. Um, the report, or excuse me, the, the plan and both the toolkit don't go into quite that detail, um, but, but we did adjust it so that it does mention, um, I would say, the first couple of steps in that direction. Mr. Weimer. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, my question really centers around, well, I have two questions. First, um, centers around you know, the diversity that we have in terms of topology within Dr. Cog. So did you look at um, applicable TDM measures that would um, select rural areas versus urban areas? And can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that this is um, definitely a really big challenge that the TDM world is struggling with, right, um, especially with that rural land typology is, um, you know, what types of TDM services and, and infrastructure strategy are really ap applicable to those typologies. So um, we did hold a focus group with um, some of our rural typology Dr. Cog members um, and um, kind of had that discussion around around your question. Um, and I will say that within the toolkit itself, as you can see on the screen here, um, and, and I'll do a bad job about describing it, but we have um, kind of like a land use context um, bar in each of those strategies, and it'll say like rural land use, maybe the strategy isn't as applicable, rural land use, maybe this one is more applicable. Um, so based on that discussion we had with those focus groups, um, with our Dr. Cog member governments, like you mentioned, that have those rural typologies, um, we were kind of able to pinpoint which TDM strategies might be more useful, might be um, more easily implemented. Um, I will say that, as we all know, it is a challenge, and so perhaps it's not as many strategies as we would have liked, but that is the great thing about this toolkit is that we'll be able to go back to it, um, make changes to it, updates 
to it um, so we can keep further exploring kind of what strategies are best implemented in those, um, those land uses. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, and then the second kind of goes along with that. And how does this integrate with CDOT's requirements for TDM with 1601? And how did you integrate those? Yeah, that's a great question because I think that's something that we've been discussing and thinking about um, as those um, requirements as more projects pop up. Um, and we've actually been in touch with CDOT um, and, uh, uh, and talking about that as well. But um, I do think that the toolkit will be a great resource for those projects um, and, and looking at which TDM strategies are applicable for those projects. Of course, I can't speak on behalf of CDOT, um, but we do hope that this toolkit will be um, a great resource for those projects. Additional questions or comments? Well, thank you, Ms. Fallon. It's really exciting to see the work that um, Dr. Cog is doing in the area of TDM and developing um, ideas and how to move forward as a region, as well as a toolkit to help local stakeholders. I know we have a lot of communities that are doing a lot of work in TDM, but there's also many that are really looking for this guidance to move forward. Appreciate the efforts. No additional questions or comments? Is there a motion? Mr. Greenwald. I'll move to recommend the to the Regional Transportation Commission or committee, excuse me, the draft Regional Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. Is there a second? Mr. Pilgrim? I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposition and any abstentions? Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Fallon. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next item. The, um, sorry, item number eight 2022 annual report on roadway traffic congestion in the Denver region is attachment F in your packet. I'll hand it over to Max Monk, Assistant Planner. Hello. Hi there. Um, Robert Spots, uh, Mobility Analytics Program Manager, here to introduce Max for the most part, but just a quick introduction. This is a 2022 annual report, and with the, the way we've been coming out of the pandemic, that seems like ancient history a bit. Uh, just for a, a bit of a reminder, uh, Dr. Cog did not actually officially go back to the office until April 1st of 2022 wearing masks for most of that year. Um, so things have changed a lot since then. Um, happy to have a lot of that in our rearview mirror. But as we're thinking about the data in this report, just a reminder, but um, quick show of hands here. Since the pandemic today, how many of you are traveling in a different way than you were before? Working different ways. How about getting um, packages or food delivered more often to your home? some folks back to the way. And then last question is, um, today, do you feel like congestion is near uh, the, the place it was in 2019 before the pandemic, or are we not quite to that point yet? Higher, we got some hires. Oh, oh. All right, well, Max is gonna give you an amazing presentation. This is Max's first presentation to the TAC. He's, uh, he's gonna do an amazing job for you, so I'll turn it over. Thank you, Robert. Madam Chair, members of the TAC, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Max Monk, and I'm a recent addition to the Mobility Analytics Program here at Dr. Cog. I just want to express that I'm very excited to be here, and uh, yeah, thank you for, for having me. So today we're here to talk about the 2022 Annual Report on Congestion for our region. There we go. So this report is part of a congestion management process, or a CMP. Uh, the CMP is a federally required process to monitor the evolution of congestion in our region. Uh, components of Dr. Cog's process include a database of roadway attributes, traffic counts, and crash incidents. So this uh, takes into account things like number of lanes on a facility, number of traffic signals, so on and so forth. Um, and then we also take a look at multimodal data metrics. We stitch this into our second component, which is what we're here to talk about today, uh, the annual report on congestion. 
Uh, to provide a brief overview of what we're hoping to cover, uh, we'll start with uh, trends and observations that we saw in 2022. We'll look at vehicle miles traveled, transit ridership, and shared micromobility usage. We'll talk about how we can expect congestion to look in 2050 should the dynamics we observed last year continue into the future. Um, every year we try to add some value to this uh, federally required process by um, undertaking a special topic analysis um, based on you know, what, what, what's interesting or um, prevalent within the data. So this year uh, includes an analysis looking at the shifting dynamics of commute corridors. And then lastly, we wanted to try something new and look externally at, at what, what, what is the rest of the nation doing in this realm. Um, so we'll highlight a couple of key stories in, in that space as well. So to, to start with those 22, 2022 trends and observations, uh, starting with vehicle miles traveled or VMT. VMT refers to the total mileage traveled on our roadways across all vehicles on a given day. So this is a daily metric. Uh, the chart that you see on screen represents VMT as it's changed from 2000 to 2022. Uh, it's generally increased, um, flattening and decreasing at a couple of, of points, notably during the, the recession period as well as a stark decrease between 2019 and 2020 of about 15% uh, during the pandemic. And then between 2020 and 2021, we saw it increase pretty, pretty starkly as more people um, sort of returned to a new sense of normal. Um, however, between 2021 and 2022, we only saw an increase of about 1% VMT. So we're still notably below pre-pandemic levels uh, for this metric. We also take a look at VMT per capita, so how that, that same metric looks in comparison to our region's population. Uh, it's followed a lot of the same trends and increasing, decreasing at the same points, and it's also still below pre-pandemic levels. We do have a target in our regional transportation plan of 23 VMT per capita. Um, we are still notably ab above that target. Um, however, we're hoping to, to leverage some of these changes in travel behavior to uh, hopefully bring us back in the right direction to, to meet that target. Uh, shifting our focus, looking at transit ridership. Um, so this, this chart is a little bit different. It represents a percent difference um, compared to 2019 um, for average daily riot transit ridership in our region. So you'll see a pretty strong decrease at the beginning of the pandemic, um, bottoming out at about 70%. And since then, it's, it's ebbed and flowed, generally increasing. Um, it has re it's recovered a little bit slower than VMT, um, given uh, a few different variables, um, notably a reduction in, in service levels, um, an increase in telework, and, uh, in, you know, just sort of a, a re remaining uh, concern about exposure to the virus, um, as well as, as other safety concerns. We did see uh, zero fare for better air during this period. Um, that did see the, the highest point of um, transit ridership since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so that's something we're excited to see. Um, we do notably have additional data in 2023 showing a, a, a continued increase, um, but we wanted to keep the focus on 2022 to maintain an apples to apples comparison for all of the modes that we're looking at. So the last, last sort of mode that we're going to take a look at before shifting back um, to, to automobile travel is shared micromobility usage. So shared micromobility refers to uh, shared devices that are smaller than an automobile, so bikes, scooters. I'm sure that many of you have an idea of what those look like. They're, they tend to be prevalent in urban, urban centers. Um, and different from VMT and transit, this, this mode has, has pretty strongly increased um, from 2019 on. Uh, in fact, it's, it's tripled in its ridership. This chart represents average number of micromobility trips per day. So shifting back to, to our roadways, um, we were really, really interested in um, where, where are we seeing the highest magnitude of congestion? Where is it most severe, especially on those facilities uh, really geared towards automobile travel like our freeways? Um, through internal and external discussions, we um, highlighted a, a few different corridors that we wanted to look at. And these couple on screen um, tell, tell a pretty interesting story. So we wanted to, to share out on that here. Um, the corridors on screen are I-25 from I-70 to University Boulevard and I-270 in its entirety. These corridors represent uh, roughly 3% of the length of our freeway network. Um, but despite this, they, um, they bear about 22% of delay. So delay refers to a noticeable slowdown, stop and go traffic, um, where, where motorists are, are delayed from reaching their destination in a more expected time frame. 
Another way to look at this is um, that despite only accounting for 3% of our freeway network, uh, these two corridors comprise roughly one in five of the minutes spent in stop and go traffic on our freeways. So we thought that was really interesting and, and wanted to share that, that context. So to, to take a step back and, and look at all of this at a, at a bit higher of a level, we wanted to, to consider you know, how how can we expect congestion to look in 2050 should what we observed last year continue onwards into the future? Uh, should those conditions continue, we can expect vehicle miles traveled per capita to grow to 27 miles per day. Uh, that's compared to our Metro Vision goal of 23 miles per day. Um, every year we uh, calculate an estimated cost of congestion based on time spent um, in traffic instead of doing something more productive, um, fuel spent idling, so on and so forth. This is just to, to estimate a burden associated with congestion and how that shifts over time. Um, and we can expect that to increase by 67% between last year and 2050. Uh, for, for those of you who've been part of this committee or other committees for some time, you've probably seen similar presentations, and this is a graphic we've used uh, a couple of times, but it does remain true. Um, congestion at 2 p.m. in 2050 is expected to look and feel a lot like congestion at 5 p.m. looked in 2022. So what this means is that that afternoon rush hour, we're expecting to shift temporally. Um, we can expect that rush hour to, to start earlier on in the day and, um, and to last longer as well. So to, to provide some spatial context, the, the red lines that you see on screen represent corridors that we identified as congested in 2022. You'll see a lot of I-25, I-225, I-270, um, and then a lot of core arterials, Federal, Sheridan, Wadsworth. Um, and then the orange lines represent additional corridors we can expect to, to be congested by 2050. So we're seeing more freeways, more arterials, and just showing that um, not only is, are we expecting congestion to, to spread temporally, but spatially in our region as well. So to, to focus in on our special topic analysis, um, we, we were really interested in the shifting dynamics in commuting in our region. As we all know, telework became a, a public health necessity during the pandemic. Um, people were urged and at times required to, to stay home to help slow the spread uh, of the virus. And telework remains more, more frequent and prevalent following uh, the influence of the pandemic. And this is especially the case for those who have uh, historically commuted into an office environment. This led us to the question, have the dynamics on these historic office commute corridors shifted? Are we seeing changes in, in data? Are there more trips being taken, fewer trips being taken in certain areas, so on and so forth? Uh, this led us to examine travel time, so how long uh, it takes on average to, to travel um, a specific corridor from end to end, and then traffic volume data um, accounting, you know, how many vehicles are we seeing on a facility in a given day? So we took those two metrics and looked at them for both prior to the pandemic and in 2022 as well. We took, it a, took a look at a handful of different corridors based on key destinations. So uh, the, the few that, that you see on screen represent commute corridors to, to specific areas. Uh, the orange corridor represents Lakewood to downtown Denver along US 6. The purple one represents Highlands Ranch to the Denver Tech Center. And then the green one represents Mid Aurora to the Denver International Airport. Starting with that Lakewood to Denver corridor, um, and we'll start with that travel time variable. Um, in 2019, it would have taken you an average of 11 minutes to travel this corridor from end to end. Um, but in 2022, that was down to nine minutes. So that's a 14% decrease in travel time and as such stop and go uh, traffic delay. Um, while two minutes might not feel like a lot, um, that's multiplied across all of the volume on, on that facility. So that, that's, that's a pretty strong time savings and also provides um, air quality and greenhouse gas emission benefits as well. Looking at that second variable, um, this quarter is saw about the same level of traffic in 20, compared to 2019. Um, however, looking at it from a sort of hourly standpoint, there were 17% fewer vehicles during that morning peak. So there are less people commuting into downtown um, in, in the morning. So that, that you know, the, the decrease in travel time, but the, the main maintaining of the, the same level of trips shows us that telecommuting and flexible schedules are, are a pretty key explanation for this decrease. The second corridor we looked at is Mid Aurora to the Denver Inter International Airport. Um, again, starting with, with travel time, it, it took you an average of 25 minutes to travel this corridor from end to end. Um, and in 2022, it, it was about the same. So there, there was really no change there. Um, 
We also saw about the same level of traffic compared to 2019, um, and notably during the, the busier travel months, we actually saw more traffic. So, you know, between those two two elements, we, we feel this corridor is back, um, and, and this is sort of what we were expecting, right? Uh, the, the Denver airport had a record number of passengers in 2022. It was labeled as the third busiest airport in the world, um, and we also have seen a, a 20% increase in jobs and a 6% increase in housing. So. I, I do want to note we didn't we we expected this we didn't expect telecommuting to play a huge role here, um, but we wanted to to see you know how how is travel behavior changing around the airport and how does that com- compare to the corridors where we were expecting some changes from telecommuting. And then the last corridor that we looked at is Highlands Ranch to the Denver Tech Center. Um, it was very similar to the Lakewood corridor in that um, it saw a decrease in travel time and traffic delay. Um, you can see the numbers on screen. Um, but where it differs is it saw fewer trips across all time periods compared to 2019. So there's there's less travel being being um, being had on this corridor and and less delay. So we we think telework is playing some role here, but we do also acknowledge the C-470 managed lane um, did also open during this period, so we, we feel it's some combination of those two elements that are, are causing this shift. Throwing a lot at you, I promise we're almost there. So the last sort of uh, piece that we wanted to, to do here today was um, highlight a couple of key stories that we, we observed from um, around the nation. Um, so. Um, we have a few on screen, a uh, discussion of communication between smartphones and traffic signals in Dallas, Texas. So um, I'll, I'll go into more detail of that in a second. Uh, production of a digital twin modeling congestion live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then the implementation of congestion pricing for streets south of 60th Street in New York City. So in Dallas, Texas, um, maybe I should take a step back. Um, you know. Smartphones have become very prevalent in our society, right? Um, we use them especially for nav- navigation, plug destinations in, and it'll show you the best route to, to get to your destination. Um, and it also shows you where you can expect slowdowns to occur. Um, and this is because you know people have smartphones are, and are in those areas experiencing it. Um, and in other words, smartphones network with each other. They know where congestion exists. And Dallas is considering upgrading their traffic signals to tap into this network and uh, give their, their planners and traffic engineers a means to better time signals um, signals live so, so they can help um, mitigate um, congestion on arterial facilities. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, with a partnership for the, with the National Renewable Energy Lab and Department of Energy, um, they were able to create a micro model mirror, mirroring Chattanooga traffic conditions with precision. Um, and this is this is known as a digital twin. So similar to that last example, they're using data from from smartphones, from connected vehicles, as well as the um, deployment of on-street sensors to um, to be able to model congestion live. Um, so that's why it's called a digital twin. It's it's all happening as as it's occurring, and and it it gives them an insight um, to to better understand the underlying causes of congestion and pinpoint specific areas for improvement. Um, to our understanding from this, this study, um, planners were able to implement and pinpoint specific areas of improvement, and um, once those were implemented, researchers observed a 32% reduction in delay and a 16% reduction in fuel spent idling. So um, this one we're really excited about. Um, NREL and the DOE are notably trying to scale this up and bring it to other communities, so this is something we'll keep an eye on moving into the future. Lastly, taking a look at congestion pricing in New York City. I'm sure this this one many of you have heard about. It's garnered some media attention. Um, what what this is is the the city, the state, and Federal Highway Administration recently approved a cordon zone in the Central Business District in Southern Manhattan. Uh, this will apply to all personal and commercial vehicles on streets below 60th Street in Manhattan, so not arterials or thoroughfares or freeways. Um, tolls will range from a low of $5 per driver overnight to a high of $23 per driver during peak periods. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not like a VMT sort of toll. It's just a, you pay once when you enter and that that's, that's the only time you pay. Um, they're notably trying to account for lower income drivers um, by giving them a 25% discount. Um, after 10 trips that that will increase to 50%. Uh, revenue generated from, from the tolls will largely go to the funding of MTA, and um, the city feels that this will help reduce BMT and also encourage uh, people to utilize other modes of travel. 
So lastly, in conclusion, um, you know, we, we aren't really seeing VMT reaching 2019 levels yet. Um, and that 2050 future I mentioned uh, should be taken with a grain of salt, right? Um, that's just if those conditions we saw last year continue into the future. Um, and we really do have the power to, to change that direction. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, I just want to highlight some of the key um, key work that's that's happening in our region. We have Denver Region ITS helping to um, to connect motorists with information um, regarding crash incidents and congestion. Um, we're partnering with the state to undertake a new household travel survey. So this will connect us to new information surrounding travel behavior in our region. As you saw from our last presentation, um, we're, we're doing transportation demand management. We have way to go. Um, this work is helping shift um, single occupancy vehicle trips into multimodal trips. And then lastly, here at Dr. Cog and across many of our member agencies, um, there are a lot of projects underway that are, are going to help facilitate additional travel choices to help um, people avoid the worst impacts of congestion. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any comments or questions. And Madam Chair, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Monk, for that very thorough presentation. I appreciate it. Any questions or comments? And just as a reminder for the TAC that this is just a discussion item and uh, there is no uh, action for this item. <laughs> Mr. Pilgrim. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Monk, Mr. Spots. Uh, th this is a fascinating topic to me, uh, especially as, as you've pointed out, uh, the changes over the last four years um, I mean, for, for the better part of 50 years, we've used a traditional process to forecast travel demand, and we got pretty good at it uh, in aggregate. But um, I, I'm just, I, I'm really uh, interested, concerned, I guess, about how we go forward, because the basis for a lot of our project and, and program support is based on a, a forecast of some sort. And, uh, I, you know, the, the, as you walk through all of the, the different components that you've identified relative to congestion, I, I agree with each, each and every one of them. I, I wonder how trip purpose has changed and how that has then contributed to the extension of these periods, uh, the change in modal choice, uh, you know, if it's not all that congested, why, why do I need to take a different mode? I'm just going to drive my car, especially now that gas is under three bucks a gallon. Uh, you know, th there's a whole dynamic there that has changed. And I'm wondering, how are we approaching that from uh, a profession standpoint? Did you get some insight there? Yeah, Madam Chair, Mr. Pilgrim, uh, I'll turn that question to Mr. Spots. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pilgrim. It's a great question and a, a really big challenge for us right now, really entering into a kind of new model. We're very fortunate that we are partnering with the state right now to do one of the first household surveys, as Max mentioned, coming out of the pandemic. So we were scheduled to do this in 2020. That wouldn't have been a good idea. So here we are, we, one of the first. So that, that is starting on January 8th. If you get the mailer, please take uh, the survey. They're going to be mailed out all year long. So really important to kind of understand this new dynamic about travel behavior. But I think the other thing we've seen is, I mean, aside from the obvious fact that unpredictable stuff happens all the time, nobody predicted the pandemic crisis and all those things is that been a lot of scenario planning lately, not just um, kind of to inform our RTP process, but also in the context of the greenhouse gas planning work we did, which is kind of another official version of our future. And we've, we've seen that, you know, we don't have, even internally, we don't have one story of what the future is. We, we do know that if, if we change certain contexts about the built environment or the way people behave or the opportunities for telework, we can get, and especially land use, frankly, we can get really big swings in terms of those. So I think it's more about, we look at it as we want to use our model as a tool to inform decision makers about if you make certain specific investments or policies, this might be the outcome or they might, this might move the needle further in the direction we um, that's how I think I'm at least interpreting this. Moving forward. And I think that's a terrific answer in the right direction we should go. Um, I, I wonder how much time we have to be able to put that foundation underneath us, especially when uh, we challenged on greenhouse gas or the air quality thresholds that we 
or exceeding, and then that puts federal money at risk. So, um, I mean, the sooner the better, in, in my opinion. I would, I would say that, um, you know, the, the greenhouse gas transportation planning work we did last year followed a really aggressive uh, RTP update already. So I would say we've put a pretty good step forward in this last um, year. We're really excited about a lot of the changes that we've made, including these BRT corridors. And obviously there's a ton of um, discussion about the land, future land use and how that important that is um, to meet our goals. Honestly, uh, frequently more important than transportation infrastructure. Just one last observation. Uh, the uh, Manhattan project, well, all right, what in the Manhattan project? <laughs> the New York City project um, it happens to be a, a project that my company is doing, and the project manager is somebody many of you already know, uh, Mike Lewis, um, used to be the executive director at CDOT. He's keeping the governor and the mayor and all the other people uh, satisfied with the answers about how this is going to actually work. Mr. Rieger? Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Just um, what Robert said was absolutely correct. Just to go back to Mr. Pilgrim's first point, everything Robert said, and as a preview of coming attractions, we will be starting the middle of next year, our major, our next major update to our regional transportation plan, where we will once again get into those very issues that Mr. Pilgrim is raising around those relationships between demographics and age and housing and mobility and congestion and air quality, greenhouse gas emissions and more. Um, so I do think we have taken a good step forward, but more to come. Mr. Schmidt. Yeah, no, that was, you know, being a traffic engineer, this is a really exciting document, right, to look through, and, and I think it's really thorough, and appreciate Dr. Carr kind of looking at how the whole region is working together, and it allows all the jurisdictions, right, to kind of see how it all fits together. Um, so just two questions. One, I know we have seen probably 23 and into 24, a lot of our larger office complexes really starting to come back to the office much more full-time than they probably were in 22. Um, so I just think it'll be an interesting dynamic to kind of see, right, what those trends look like. I don't know what others are seeing, but I, I do think um, some of that VMT may start to creep back up, right, as people are, are being pushed back into some of the offices. So uh, I'm not sure we're seeing that full effect yet in 22. Um, and then the other piece was I really like the technology conversation. You know, cities are all trying this in jurisdictions and states. Um, but I do think that is there's a significant investment in technology that will improve our operations uh, may be a lot more significantly than heavy, heavy road construction. And so focusing on that here is, is really great to see. And I hope we can all kind of work together on that uh, more, right, as we move forward and learn lessons from what you're seeing at the region um, that we can all take lessons from. So, Mr. Hydray. Mr. Hydray, Boulder County. Um, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, speaking of different policies or scenarios, as part of the RTP update, will Dr. Cog be modeling the impact of a hypothetical congestion pricing scheme in the area on projected or future congestion? Madam Chair, Mr. Hyde Wright, I don't believe that is part of our scope um, for our modeling efforts. Um, I will note all the strategies that we included in the presentation um, were we're informative. We're not recommending any of them per se, especially as staff. Um, but yeah, Robert, would you like to add anything else there? Yeah. Mr. Rieger? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, thanks for that question, Alex. At, at this time, no, we're not contemplating something um, exactly like that, no. Um, again, our RTP update will be getting started in earnest uh, about the middle of next year, so we're about half a year away. So we are starting to think through some of the work that we'll do around scenario planning and some other components of the plan, but we're not ready to say that we're gonna, we're gonna definitely scenario plan this, but not that. Ms. Micklebest. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for this booklet. I'm gonna share it with my team and Dr. Cog always does really nice materials. So appreciate that. Just have a question you may or may not know and that's okay on the, um, the New York project. How does that work for um, like Uber and Lyft drivers every you know it's you have a very porous system with roads going in and out of it and people make several trips a day do you know do they pay each time they cross the line or do they get a special license and that just generally curious 
Madam Chair, Ms. Micklebust, yes, um, I, I did manage to, to find that. It, it does seem like um, the, the city is working in partnership with uh, its taxi service and Lyft rideshare, um, and it, it seems like the, the most likely outcome with that um, mode will be a, a decreased toll will be borne by the, the passenger driving in. So I think they're working with Uber and Lyft to, to have that fee added when, when passengers are charged. So I see on slide six, you really looked at comparison of VMT. Did you do a similar comparison with VHT and what that looked like? And do you have that off the top of your head or can you share that? Madam Chair, Mr. Weimer, we do have that data on hand. We didn't look too closely at it for this report. I'm happy to, to follow up and um, read into it give you some information. I think that's another data point when you start talking about congestion. That would be interesting to see if it's comparable with kind of what you're seeing with VMT or what that really looked like in terms of trends. Oh, Jean. Oh, Jean. Yeah. <laughs> Jean Sanson, Ms. Sanson. <laughs> Um, so, Mr. Spass and Mr. Monks, thank you. Perfect presentation. Um, you had a slide up there about the shared micromobility usage a minute ago. It's really exciting to see the explosion. I'm curious, did you dig a little deeper into what types of travel or trips they're replacing? Madam Chair, Ms. Sanson, I will say this, this data comes from Ride Report, and it is a little bit uh, constrained perhaps is the best word. Um, we were able to see trip lengths, we're able to um, see uh, how long the trip lasted. So those sorts of metrics, um, unfortunately, we're not able to see, um, you know, what, what trip purpose it, it served. We can't see uh, if it was linked with a transit trip, for example, or um, if, if people were um, switching from a single occupancy vehicle trip. I will say most of them tend to be shorter trips as sort of expected. Um, so I think that's about all of the context I can provide. Sorry. <laughs> and Robert will add more. I think it was the Downtown Denver Partnership that did a survey a while ago, and it was roughly a third of those trips replaced a single occupancy vehicle. So that with what you will, I don't know if there's much more information. Here we are. The only thing I would mention is that I'm a student of logistics, and we have seen significant changes since COVID in home delivery, first, what they call it first mile, last mile. In my neighborhood, there's four or five trucks every day, whether it's the Postal Service or FedEx or Amazon or somebody. Regardless of what fuel they consume, they add to the congestion issues. And I think you need to be at least passingly aware that that's not going to change. If anything, it's going to increase because people are found that it's a lot easier to go to Amazon than it is to Walmart. Any additional questions or comments off the cog? Uh, Mr. Quinn. Yeah, just a real quick question on slide six, and my apologies if you did mention this. Why is it that the VMT per capita is constant total VMT up until 2005? Madam Chair, Mr. Quinn, I'm going to let Robert answer that question. Uh, it's uh, frankly, it's just a coincidence, I think. Um, so, but, you know, basically, it, what it really implies is that it, for the, for that period, VMT and population were basically growing at the same rate. And after 2005, they kind of decoupled a bit. So, even during that period of uh, 2007 to 2013, Great Recession, even though VMT was not growing, our population was still growing pretty intensely. So that's where that kind of decoupling happened, and they have not gone back to that. Okay, thank you. And yes, yeah, let me add also. Fantastic report. So. Mr. Hyde-Wright. Wondering if Dr. Cog has looked at congestion's impact on transit, and particularly given RTD's persistent driving shortage, needing more drivers to provide the same level of service because buses are stuck in traffic is a lose-lose. So I'm wondering if that's been evaluated. 
Madam Chair, Mr. Hyde-Wright, uh, that wasn't something we looked too closely at for this report, but it is an item of interest um, and something we're considering for a future report. Um, Robert, do you have any? Yeah. Rieger? Yeah, Alex, it's a good question. I will say um, in a little bit of a different lens as we've gotten into our corridor planning work um, and going through existing conditions on the first couple of corridors, including South Boulder Road, that is something that we're looking at along many sort of existing conditions data points, but just, you know, at least at the corridor level, what's happening on some of these corridors, uh, both congestions, traffic operations, transit ridership, transit delay, and those sorts of things. So not quite this regional look, but we are paying attention to that as we go through some of these more specific studies. Uh, any further questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monk and Mr. Spots for this presentation and report. This, this is a report I always look forward to every year, and this is just fascinating information. I really appreciate the multimodal uh, context, adding in the transit trips as well as micromobility. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to, um, so that concludes our discussion items and the next item are informational items. These are typically to be read on your own time. This is item number nine, fiscal year 2023, the annual listing of obligated projects. And if you have any questions regarding that attachment, you may reach out to Mr. Schwenk for any questions or clarification. Um, and then we'll move on to our last items here. This will be the administrative item. Um, will do we have any updates from the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group, uh, Mr. Priest? Uh, not this month, Madam Chair, but I'll have one next month. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, does Dr. Cog have additional comments or updates? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to take a moment both to say happy holidays, but really to say thank you to all of you. Um, I know it's been a big year for all of you. It's been a big year for all of us at Dr. Cog. It's been a big year for this committee. Um, if you'll recall, when we updated our committee guidelines, we actually significantly expanded the membership of this committee as of um, middle of this year, so a lot of you were new um, to this committee. I just want to appreciate you being here, the time that you take working with all of you. I also want to recognize our staff. It's the smart people sitting behind us that are actually doing the hard work, and they've done a heck of a lot of it this year, and you've seen some of that today. So just want to express appreciation both for all of you, um, our local governments and our partners, um, as well as Dr. Cox staff, and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you to all the new members to the TAC, and we're really looking forward to 2024. Uh, the next meeting, um, it, well, just as a reminder, if you did not sign in, please do be sure you do sign in or check in with uh, Mr. Kennedy before you leave. Our next meeting will be Monday, January 2022, 2024, and the final page in your packet includes all of the um, uh, meetings for next year. So please put that on hold on for your calendars, and we are now adjourned at 2.47 p.m. Thank you.